Hi, my name is Arati and I'm a journalist at Media Nama. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the research presentations for the 2022 cohort of the Meta India Tech Scholars. Meta launched the program to provide a research and mentorship platform to law students who are keen to engage on contemporary questions of technology, law, and policy. The law firm Shardil Amachan Mangadas & Co. is supporting the program as a knowledge partner. Through this series, the scholars will show us how specific policy choices in the technology sector influence and impact India's tryst with the internet. For today's showcase, I'm delighted to introduce you to Laya. Laya is a final year law student at the National Law Institute University, Bhopal. Through the course of the Meta India Tech Scholars Program, she researched on technology facilitated gender-based violence in light of the upcoming Digital India Act. She worked on analyzing the regulatory framework governing technology facilitated gender-based violence, shed light on the existing regulatory gaps, and suggested recommendations for the upcoming Digital India Act to be more inclusive. Laya has spent time interning with various organizations, including law firms and independent councils, and has participated in several other co-curricular activities too. Great to have you here, Laya, and look forward to hearing from you on this topic. Over the last few months, I've researched and technology facilitated gender-based violence in light of the upcoming Digital India Act. My paper discusses TFGPB, the current Indian legislation, regulating the same, and suggests recommendations for the upcoming Digital India Act. There has been significant discussion on India's technology regulations in light of privacy and data protection, but there hasn't been a lot of discourse through a gendered lens. My research aims to feed into the discourse as well as the ongoing policymaking exercise and aims to help in creating a more inclusive internet for all communities. The research addresses the existing challenges in the tech space from a gendered lens, and it can help in envisioning a more rights enabling and inclusive digital space for all communities. Women and other minorities are most vulnerable in the digital space, and this research is looking at the current challenges faced by gender minorities in light of the upcoming Digital India Act and aims to address these challenges through the new legislation. The key factors that I focused on during my research were what is technology facilitated gender-based violence, why is tackling TFGBB a priority, inefficiency of the current Indian legislations to regulate TFGBB, global initiatives to tackle TFGBB, and lastly, how the Digital India Act can tackle TFGBB. The internet has revolutionized the way we communicate, access information, and conduct business. However, new challenges have emerged with the rapid expansion of online platforms. One of the most concerning issues in the prevalence of technology facilitated gender-based violence, which includes cyberbullying, sexual harassment, stalking, and other forms of harmful behavior, which not only affect the victim's mental and emotional health, but also have a detrimental impact on their professional and personal life. The lack of effective regulation has allowed them to proliferate, and therefore, it is imperative to understand the evolution of the internet and the need for regulating TFGBB to ensure a safe and inclusive online environment for all. A global study found that 38% of women have had personal experiences of online violence, and 85% of women who spend time online have witnessed digital violence against other women. The impact of TFGBB can be as harmful as offline violence, with negative effects on the health and well-being of women and girls, as well as serious economic, social, and political impacts. It can also restrict the online activity of women and girls and inhibit their access to the internet, increasing the digital gender divide. TFGBV has been a persistent issue for the last few decades, and with the pace at which technology is evolving across the world, it is crucial for governments and stakeholders across the world to come together to tackle this issue efficiently. India has an exhaustive framework of laws, including the POSH Act and the Prevention of Women from Domestic Violence Act, which regulate gender-based violence. However, most of these laws do not explicitly extend to online platforms. The current legislative framework addressing TFGBB is largely restricted to a few provisions from central legislation, such as the IT Act and the IPC. Section 66E, 67, 67A, and B of the Information Technology Act provide for punishment in case of transmission of sexually explicit content in an electronic form. Women can also initiate action against online harassment under sections 354A, C, D, and 507 and 509 of the IPC. While these provisions provide for punishment of the perpetrator, they aren't victim-centric approaches and do not provide for a comprehensive redressive process. Clearly, Indian laws are yet to fully address the many harms of TFGBB, and we hope the Digital India Act will pave the way with it. Other countries have adopted different policy approaches to address this issue, which may prove to be use a useful reference point. Over the years, nations have implemented various strategies and initiatives to combat online gender-based violence, often amending their information technology or data protection laws. 
to reflect their commitment towards eliminating such violence and addressing TFGBV. The United States strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally in 2022 was a comprehensive initiative that tackled the urgent issue of gender-based violence on a global scale. This strategy focused on three fundamental pillars, prevention, response, and coordination. It's only been a year since the introduction of this policy, so we are yet to see how it pans out. Australia's criminal code amendment criminalizes sharing of abhorrent violent material and abhorrent violent conduct. While this enactment mandates takedowns, it does not mandate refiltration, but it does reduce the times of the takedown. Germany has a Network Enforcement Act to combat fake news, hate speech, and unlawful content. However, despite these efforts, gender-based violence remains alarmingly prevalent globally, with an increase in both frequency and types of cases in recent years. At the moment, there is little to no harmonization across jurisdictions to have a unified stance against online violence against women. The United Nations has conducted research studies, published papers, and policy briefs to address the issue of TFGBB. And, also, and although these policies and initiatives look great on paper, the question of how to effectively implement these policies is yet to be tackled. While there have been some changes in legislations across the world to address hate speech, which is one of the most common forms of TFGBB, there is still a long way to go in addressing other forms of TFGBB or drafting a comprehensive legislation which ensures prevention, remediation, timely response, and rehabilitation of the victim. The government of India plans on overhauling the existing legislation regulating platform, online platforms to make way for a comprehensive and dynamic legislation to regulate digital platforms by introducing the Digital India Act. India could pave the way and become one of the first countries to effectively tackle TFGBB. It is imperative that this act addresses concerns with regard to today's social media platforms and is a lucrative law amenable to change with circumstances and technological advancements. Formulating such legislation requires a focus on the Indian ecosystem, the social, legal, so, the social, legal, socio-economic, and cultural diversity. The proposed legislation should address a wide spectrum of threats, including TFGPP, and it should evolve a forward-thinking legislation that takes notes of emerging technologies and their vulnerabilities provides protections against national, economic, and individual threats, and withstands judicial scrutiny and the test of time. To tackle an issue as prevalent as TFGPP, there must be concerted efforts from all stakeholders, and it cannot be the sole responsibility of the government or the platform to address this issue. The Digital India Act will shape the future of the country's cyber landscape and can provide a guiding framework for all different stakeholders at different stages of the process. The Act shouldn't just provide for the perpetrator to be punished, but must also address measures which can be taken to prevent TFGBB, ensure appropriate remedies and rehabilitation for the victim, and call for intermediaries and law enforcement to respond in a timely and sensitive manner. To my paper, I suggest, I suggest that the Digital India Act include precise and clear provisions that specifically address offenses against women, which are framed in a manner which can be easily understood by an ordinary person, thus acting as a deterrent. The current Indian legislations have limited provisions addressing TFGBB. The new act should include offenses such as doxing and a wider spectrum of cyber offense. A more centralized manner, I further suggest a more centralized manner to spread awareness regarding TFGBB, which could potentially start in schools for students in grades six and seven. The legislations currently mandate takedown of posts and content instead of prefiltration. The government can work with social media platforms to implement prefiltration technology, which could potentially curb the TFGBB numbers. The legislation, sorry. These intermediaries must also offer an easy accessible reporting system on their platforms, allowing users to report illegal content. For example, almost every police department in urban cities has an Instagram page. There could be an option to report crime directly through this page. In the current times, technology is evolving at an extremely rapid pace, which could potentially lead to new challenges. The Digital India Act must be amenable to change to be able to tackle upcoming issues. We must ensure we learn from every new challenge and keep updating our policies, as well as the service the tech platforms provide, and ensure that all stakeholders work together to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Laya. That was really interesting. And I think uh, given that the Digital India Act is being touted as like an omnibus law, this is a really useful breakdown of some of the things that one of the, the law's many chapters should actually be focusing on. So I think that's this is like a great sort of first step in outlining that. Uh, and when I was listening to your presentation, the points are taken super well. I think um, many women who exist on the internet have probably been at the receiving end of some kind of tangible or intangible violence. 
but something I've noticed in my reporting, and it's something my colleagues and I have brought up repeatedly as well, is that a lot of these provisions concerning crimes against women uh, could easily happen to anyone from any any gender, right? It could be someone who's, you know, a male, it could be a trans person. And uh, by sort of solely framing these provisions as uh, issues that only happen to women, something we've often wondered is, does that actually end up preventing uh, different groups from also seeking to address for the same crimes that are happening online? So this is again coming to you as a layperson, not as a lawyer. So A, do you agree with you know this being an issue? And uh, if you do think it's an issue, how specifically do you think this law or any other law really can address uh, the gender bias, I guess you could call, of certain provisions? I definitely do agree that that is an issue. I believe that having gender-specific laws excludes the sections of victim from seeking any remedy or from any protection. I believe that laws are gender specific because women are viewed to be most vulnerable based on like multiple studies across the years about you know, crimes like rape or even cyber violence online. But I do believe that the act can have gender neutral provisions to ensure that each victim is protected and can take appropriate action against their perpetrator on the attack. I think gender neutral provisions would go a long way for that. Even if you know the percentage is as small as 5% of men or trans people who are affected, it would still be benefit them. Okay, great. Okay. For that, because we've seen it in various laws, I think even the IPC, uh, the IT Act. I mean, the IPC is yesteryear now, but the IT Act, at least, um, specifically talking about it in sections uh, regarding these issues. So, thank you for that. Uh, the second question that I had for you was uh, really about you know some of the recommendations that you had. So, on an intuitive level, I think it's important to stop things or prevent or penalize things like doxing or cyberbullying because they can really have terrifically harmful effects on people, especially minors as well. Um, but on the flip side, the question that I always have is, you know, these are really nascent issues. It's not like we've had 200 years of doxing literature or 200 years of cyberbullying yeah. literature to lean on, right? So how do you actually define a threshold or define when you know sharing information on someone online becomes doxing or when interacting with someone online becomes bullying how do we create that threshold to ensure that simple interactions online aren't confused for being something more menacing than they actually are but also to ensure that if those actions are menacing they are effectively and sort of robustly dealt with by the law so how would you create those uh, ring fences or thresholds I think by clearly defining doxing and cyberbullying explicitly within the legislation to ensure like a common understanding of what constitutes with doxing and cyberbullying to start off, and also you know using extremely precise provisions. I think something else that can be done is developing an objective criteria to determine the severity of an offense, and also having penalties which are proportionate. So you know have have like maybe three tiers, and then have like appropriate penalties for all of them. And I think doxing, for example, you know, it refers to publishing information about an individual which is private or could be used to identify them. So I think in this case, the information that is published about the individual can have the same threshold as what would be considered as personal data under the Data Protection Act to ensure uniformity across, you know, legislations about what is personal data and what would constitute a crime of like making someone's personal data public. Understood. Understood. So in that sense, having the Personal Data Act in place now is a useful kind of yardstick to, I guess, judge a lot of these crimes when it comes to leaking information online. Uh, so thank you so much for this, Laya. This is really, really great. And uh, if you would like to read more about Laya's work or any of the other scholars participating in this year's cohort, please do head on over to the Media Nama website uh, or the Media Nama YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you once again, Laya, for being with us today as well. Thank you so much.